All right. So uh, you touched on this a little bit, but uh, by the time you had already published a second issue with the New York State Journal of Medicine on tobacco and were even planning a third, helping to garner attention for the journal, you were suddenly fired and you mentioned that. George Lawrence, executive vice president of the Medical Society of the state of New York was the one who fired you. And as, as you mentioned, this was somewhat of a temporary position. And reading through the collection, it just seems as if he should not have been in the one. If, if there was any reason for you to be fired, he would not have been the one who should have been in charge of firing you in the first place. Not only that, but when you were questioned, by, when he was questioned, excuse me, by those who came to your defense as to why you were fired, he consistently refused to give an answer other than it had nothing to do with your work on tobacco issues. And I, one of the things I was curious to know is, were you given a concrete reason for your firing? And also, if I am correct in thinking it was entirely inappropriate for him to be the one to try to fire you in relation to the staff hierarchy? Well, that would be my interpretation. I, I was never given a reason other than I had a messy office. Um, that was literally told to me. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I just want anyone who's ever visited a newsroom to say if there was be ever a reporter who didn't have a messy desk and a messy office. But um, I think it was a, it, it was a very poor uh, relationship there from the get-go. Um, but um, what he did was he would call up his, he called up his closest board member, their, his, his closest crony. Uh, now, again, he's serving as an interim position. They're dragging their feet on hiring uh, a replacement. It's very hard to find physicians who would give up their lucrative practices to go work for organized medicine. Any physician who works at uh, a medical society is sort of a second-class citizen. If you're not practicing medicine, you're looked down upon. And uh, that's just the way it works. But when you're the head of the medical association, you're not looking down on anybody. So you, it's funny, um, they've got it. It's a very powerful position in the sense that you get paid a lot and you get to boss people around. And it's interesting that they don't do anything about the other physicians who work. There are always a couple of physicians who work at medical societies certainly the ones that are large enough to be in New York or California. And uh, the, the, the medical executive director should be very sensitive to any physician who works there, who's giving up practice to work at the medical society. But that wasn't the case of the Medical Association of State of New York, Medical Society of the State of New York. They, um, I don't think I ever felt less than a second-class citizen because I wasn't in practice like these other guys were. So uh, Lawrence um, would call up his crony and say, okay, I'm thinking of getting rid of Blum. Is that okay with you? And he said, well, yeah, okay, if it's okay with you. And then he would go to the second guy, his second closest and say, I, you know, I'm thinking of getting rid of Blum and I've got so-and-so, he, he agrees, he thinks the same way I do. So what do, you, what do you think? And he would agree. And he went down the line till he could only go so far without the people that were in favor of me knowing about it. So they loaded up this board meeting with people who um, uh, were gonna vote to get rid of me, endorse Lawrence's vote ex post facto, because I'd already gone by the time they met. And uh, because there was gonna be some questions about my firing. So he did the job first, he had me fired first, and then lined up his board people to say, oh, we agreed with it. But I had two or three people who were very, very upset about it. And uh, they tried to um, do something about it. This is all after the fact. They tried to see if I would get some severance pay. They would try to help me in some other ways. They would try to soften the blow and maybe even get back to doing the journal. But um, that didn't happen. And instead, letters started pouring in. I think we got over 40. I helped generate a few of them, but not, not 40. I mean, Dr. Koop, uh, the editors of the British Medical Journal, The Lancet, others all wrote to express their dismay over this. 
uh, of my firing. And the firing was very public. Uh, it was in the uh, American Medical News. Blum fired, Dr. Blum fired from Journal Post. And not many people get to have their personal name in a national medical journal as being fired. But even there, it didn't say anything about why, uh, which makes it worse when you're asked to leave. Is that some other kind of impropriety? Um, but, you know, it, it, it worked out and, and it was probably the best thing that ever happened because when one door closes, another one opens. And uh... when I, when I, I, I think the other telling story is when I, I called up uh, Dr. Kurt Duschel, who was a uh, renowned preventive medicine physician in New York. I had just spoken to his class at Mount Sinai a few weeks earlier and I called him and I said, I I'd just been fired. My God, what do I do now? And you know, his first words to me was, it's your own damn fault. And I took it like, well, what did I do? I, I, I didn't do it. He said, no, you, you got too far away from patients. You should never get far away from patients again. You should always be seeing patients. Now he personally was not seeing patients, but he knew that in an air editor's role, that was a precarious position. You were always at, at the mercy of the boards or whatever. So you needed to have your backup of your clinical work. And I kind of wanted to get to a more uh, personal note with the suddenness of your firing. Times must have been difficult, and especially in 1986. You eventually transitioned to the Baylor College of Medicine, but you had a, a family to take care of during that interim period. And notably, you had several physicians and medical journals coming to your defense on this exact point, including the editors of The Lancet and the British Medical Journal. And I was just wondering if there were any details from this period that might not be reflected in the collection that you would care to share. Well, just so we know too what the collection looks like, there are about five of these binders and um, I saved all the correspondence uh, with authors, um, issues that I was invited to write in by other journals and um, so these actually, this is the letters that have arrived after the second issue was published. I think we got even more letters. This was from Dr. John Last, a, a well-known preventive medicine specialist at the University of Ottawa in Canada. People would order 30 and 40 copies of these journals at a time. Here's the uh, president of the New York State, State Bar Association. Um, and um, a lot of news coverage. In fact, the medical journal, even after I was fired, they also uh, went into a second printing. So they, uh, well, actually it wasn't a second printing, but they'd made extras and they, uh, uh, they advertised that. So even, even after I was fired, they realized the thing that they were most known for was the, the two issues on smoking that I had edited. Um, and um, the third issue that you alluded to, uh, I wrote, I managed to write to all the people that I had invited to write and all but about three of them wrote letters uh, to the uh, medical society condemning my firing and withdrawing their articles from publication. They would not write for the journal. And so what, what Imperato, the guy that succeeded me did, he, 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 he pretended that that wasn't the reason I was fired. So he got out a smoking issue that was supposed to be the one that I was working on. And I think it had only about 10 articles in it, not even that many. And it was, you know, paper thin and it was pretty terrible. But what disturbed me was that a, a few of the same authors that I had invited to contribute kept their journal articles in there rather than the withdrawing them. And uh, they knew that I'd been fired. I'd, I'd personally written to them and they chose to stay in the journal. And, uh, and excuse me. <clears throat> And some of the later reflections from the late 80s and 90s included, at least in the digital form of the collection, you take issue with the medical establishment, including the Medical Society of the State of New York for their failures to address tobacco and other parallel ethical issues such as the pharmaceutical ties through advertisement. You also take, make several references to the American Medical Association and I'm curious if there's anything you would like to contextualize, contextualize, excuse me, regarding that in closing. I think you hit it on the nail. Um, there was a certain freedom to get away from medical journals. I, I, I miss editing. Um, you know, as the youngest medical editor in the world at the time, 
I, I reverse the career. Usually you become an editor after you've sort of had your flourishing career and then you get appointed to edit a medical journal and share all your wisdom. I sort of got, I sort of put in all my wisdom up front. Um, but um, it, it really is a privilege, uh, I have to say, and I, I'm immensely grateful both, both to the AMA and then to the Australian Medical Association, then to the Medical Society of the State of New York. I don't know of anybody, other physician who's worked full time for three other medical associations. Um, I, I, I wouldn't work for a medical association again, but they gave me a great opportunity and I don't want to seem that ungrateful for it. The Fishbein Fellow was a terrific opportunity. But like everything, Fishbein himself was uh, uh, not necessarily the most uh, upright individual. He, he had a lot of scandals of, of, of commercialism and so forth, but he was a, a champion of medical journalism and a champion of the AMA and a champion of fighting quackery. But he had, he had some things that a lot of people felt were very objectionable. Um, but I, I think that uh, being editor is a remarkable privilege I love the Medical Journal of Australia with the chance that they gave me. I wish we had been able to stay longer. I tried to reconnect with the current editor uh, and never got a response. So uh, about five years ago, the same thing that happened to me in New York happened to the editor of the Medical Journal of Australia. They basically pulled the rug out from under him and um, he, uh, they forced him to resign pretty much. And um, uh, they got a, a, a larger publishing company to, to do all of the work that was formerly done in the offices of the Medical Journal of Australia, and he objected to that. And so uh, a group of uh, loyalists to the journal started a Friends of MGA, Friends of the MJA, and they, I contacted them because I heard about it, and I wrote a little article in their newspaper sharing the story about my own firing, excuse me, about my own departure at the Medical Journal of Australia back then. But, um, you know, medical journals have survived beautifully in some instances, but others not so well if they were heavily invested in print. And that's what I was, heavily invested in print. So I could say that I edited medical journals in the golden age of print journals. Well, that's, those are all the questions I had for you. From my perspective, it was a privilege to have the opportunity to dig into the collection and help organize it. What are, is there any other comments you would have? No, I appreciate it so much, Caleb. Uh, what 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 were what would you say was the most intriguing aspect of working with us? Obviously, you know, I'm not necessarily thinking that my papers uh, are are that significant in the larger order of things, but the 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 collection relates to the medical journal editorship. I think is really special to me. It's my favorite collection because it was blood, sweat, and tears to produce these issues. It would have been a lot easier to produce them at the New England Journal of Medicine or the Medical or the uh, Journal of the American Medical Association. Um, but we thought of it first. We got it out before others had done this. These were the first journals on smoking at any journal in the world. And um, I felt it was important at the time. I'm glad I saved uh, all the background. There are some really intriguing stories buried in this in this in these uh, binders. But what about your own feelings? Um, my own feelings, like what impresses me most is how personal the collection is, but how it addresses a broader issue with tobacco. And uh, I would encourage people to dig into some of the materials. It's, it's very fascinating reading through it. You know, sometimes if I scroll through some letters, I'm thinking, okay, great. They thought I was a great editor. They like the, they like the issue. Oh, that's great. Fun, my fan mail. But then as you get more into it, you see some of the nuanced questions and comments, like I had the same thing happen when we tried to advertise against cigarette smoking. And uh, because it goes into, I think between the two issues, we have probably a close to 200 articles. Um, and, and we just got amazing letters from all over. Uh, one of the, the best of course was, uh, was the letter I got when this issue appeared and it was from her husband. And uh, it was a handwritten letter and, and telling me about the fact that she was 17 years old when she posed for this picture for a Chesterfield ad, which I chose on the cover because it says, after a man's heart, cigarette smoking helps cause heart disease. <laughs> and um, 
And he told me how she she got uh, colon cancer and died when she was in her late 50s. But suddenly this came alive. This was the story behind this particular individual. And um, just so many uh, friendships through that issue, uh, people who corresponded. We wrote about the Virginia Slims tennis tournament and how Dr. Renee Richards, who was a transgender individual, had been an ophthalmologist, became a member of the Virginia Slims tour and we pretty much were very critical of Renee Richards and um, the Virginia Slims. And he's, she sent a personal letter to me apologizing for having ever gone into the Virginia Slims. She regretted it. As a physician, she regretted uh, working for a cigarette company. So that kind of uh, brought, you know, that was a really positive experience. Well, obviously, if there's one item I can point out in the collection that points out that you are doing the job you should have been, it's the internal memo from Philip Morris saying this is a virulent attack on the tobacco industry. So is that a brilliant? That's, or, that's, or, that's one of my favorite items. Is it from virulent or brilliant? Vir virulent attack. All right. OK. On the tobacco industry. So, yeah, you know, and one thing, too, is I've always prided myself on being very open. I, I don't mind being corrected. In other words, if we made big mistakes, we want to hear from people. Uh, but I've actually found a few errors. But the tobacco industry itself, which has been very outspoken and criticized me on many occasions, they never corrected anything in these issues. So uh, other people found other uh, errors, but uh, we never, they could say bad things about it, but they never found anything that was wrong in the issues that were, that were factually incorrect. But I appreciate uh, all the work you did in, in helping uh, bring this collection to the next level and opening it up. And uh, hopefully we'll uh, make it a cornerstone of the website. And thank you, Caleb, for all you do and look forward to working with you uh, again. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. Right. And I guess we can leave it off there. It's